she, in her own words, was made in Taipei, Taiwan and grown in the U.S. She is absolutely incredible. I adore this lady. I am super excited to have her on my program. I got to be on her program not too long ago. Her name is Jenny C. Cohen, and I adore her. Hi, Jenny. Hello, Amanda. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I just, I love you. I love what you do. I love who you are. I love your message. Everything about you, you're just awesome. And I really hope to just hug you with the hug you deserve one of these days. I'm looking forward to it. This poor <laughs> woman's going to be like, why is she back at, at my house again for another hug? <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, when, when did you leave Taiwan? How old were you? I was almost six. Almost six. Do you remember any of it? I only remember a really unending airplane ride. Oh. <laughs> um, I remember it just, it was so long. It was a nonstop flight. Oh. And I remember my first week of school. So this isn't a, a happy story, just so you know, <laughs> I went, they enrolled me in kindergarten. And I was in the Brookline school system where I was not yet six when I was put into school because my birthday was in July and the cutoff was September. So I was a younger of that age group when I went into school in that September. They they found my classmate that could speak Mandarin and after day one, she refused to help translate for me because all the other kids were making fun of her. Oh my gosh. And I remember feeling like, oh, I have no friends. Like she doesn't just, I don't speak any English. And then because I couldn't ask her cause she wouldn't talk to me, right? And think about it. I mean, a five-year-old shouldn't, a six-year-old, five-year-old shouldn't be responsible for translating for anybody really truly. She was a baby, right? She didn't want to do it. And I had no one to tell me. So that first week I had an accident in my seat because I had to go to the bathroom. And I didn't know who to tell. Mm -hmm. So that was my first week of when I first immigrated to the States. The positive thing is I have my first taste of Coke. And there's a picture of that. <laughs> the drink, right? Not the nose candy. <laughs> Very cool. So where did you grow up? Was it all over the States? Was it kind of uh, centrally located in one spot? I grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts. I even okay. went to Brookline High School, and then I ended up going to college at Brandeis University in Waltham. Oh, wow. And you live nowhere near there now. Did you move for love or family or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I ended up going for my master's degree in occupational therapy at BU, and I had to move home during that time. And that was a rude awakening. I had had four years of freedom in undergraduate. And then I had to oh, go wow. home and it was just this, this mind meld thing where I had to go from complete independence back into really strict parents because it, I had Asian parents that were very, very strict. It's fine. Two years of master's degree. I was already engaged at that time. And so I was very boring. I would go to classes and come home, go to class and come home. And then once I was ready to get a job, I ended up in New York and oh, wow. we were in various areas of New York. Then we ended up moving out to Utah. I love wow. it out here. There's so much space. Oh, they yeah. never tell you out east that there's so much space and so much less people. Oh, yeah. You, you could go for miles without seeing anybody. And Utah is absolutely gorgeous. You're, you're just on the other side of the mountains from me over here in Colorado. And the scenery, you just can't beat it. The wildlife is incredible. Everything about these areas. We moved to Utah when I was 12, almost 13. And I left two days after I turned 18 mainly because I needed to get away from my parents. But I always kind of had that drive to want to return to the mountains. So. It's beautiful here. Uh, I'm still adjusting, actually. Six, what, seven? Well, oh, my gosh, it's nine years. Nine years. Almost nine years out mm. to the higher altitude. I do love it when I go to the beachy areas. And my very bad, asthmatically scarred lungs suddenly are super powerful because I went from high altitude to lower altitude. And I'm doing cardio because I teach a cardio dance class online. And if I'm teaching somewhere else, I'm like, wow, I'm barely out of breath. The rest of you are out of breath, but I can talk normal like this. And versus at home, I'm like <laughs> trying to get them to do their cardio belly dance. So yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that you teach dance. This has been such a big part of who you are and your healing journey and everything. When, how old were you when you first started dancing? Uh, was it fourth grade? Fourth grade. Wow. 
So it was maybe 10, 11 was my first time getting my parents who were immigrants focused on making money, right? Because <laughs> they came here not speaking any English themselves. Wow. And they they had just opened up a restaurant and I badgered my mother for months to let me go to a ballet class for little itty bitty girls. And I was the only one whose parents weren't always waiting at the, you know, outside the classroom because they, that was their, let's say it was an after school class. So that was the beginning of the dinner rush for my parents. So they couldn't really come to take me. I had to walk there by myself, walk myself back. I was like a latchkey kid when I was younger because yeah. my parents were busy. So you had your key literally around a rope around your neck. You let yourself in and out of the house. So yeah, that's when I first got to take dance class. And then um, I didn't really pick up again until high school. And I still remember my ballet instructor, Mrs. Levine, and she introduced me to ballet and modern, and I got to do a point shoes with her, and I loved it. Oh, wow. That's cool. There, There's a lot of dance mentioned in your book, and it's in, even included on the cover of the book. I have to That's ask me. you. I was going to ask if that was you on the cover. I love this. So you started out with ballet. You do belly dancing. You do all kinds because it's you. It's just you. When I came to the States, we immediately joined a, a Chinese evangelical Bible church. And I, I was baptized at 12, voted most likely to marry a pastor's son. <laughs> yeah. And then there were some indiscrepancies about the Christian attitude versus actually being shown by the adults around me. And so I rejected the Christian church. Yet, I always believed in God. I just didn't trust people's interpretations of it, <laughs> you know? And the dance form was one of the few things that I would feel connected to something bigger than me. It was my form of prayer. It ended up becoming, and it still continues to be. I love that it makes you present if you're present in your body. So for example, currently, whenever I teach you, or anybody, you also, Amanda, when I teach anyone who's in my classrooms, we will always tune in to your five senses with breath work, which lights up every part of your brain. So each of our senses is, is assigned to a part of our brain. So when you try and tune into all five of them, you're lighting up every part of your brain. Most of the time we compartmentalize, right? And then when you bring in breath work, it puts your nervous system into a learning state. So then when you're dancing, you're much more receptive to how it connects you energetically to things beyond you. That's beautiful. Thank you. And, you know, dancing goes way, way far back in history, too, even with the Bible. David danced before the Lord. I always love that story. This is something that we talked about recently in my church about how you know, dancing is a part of worship. If that is your chosen form of worship, get up and dance. If that's the only way you know how to worship, then do it. Yes, yes. I came upon a, a research person who introduced the idea that... Um, we always separate body and soul. Actually, your body is your soul. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the idea he introduced. Because when we dance, and if you are present and kinetic energetically, that's another way to connect to universe, source, God. Yeah. Because if we didn't have our body, we wouldn't be alive. So you think about that. They haven't come up with a way to put us into AI. <laughs> and even then, there is a physicality to it. There's a right. part of us that has to be housed in something physical. Yeah. Right. And so I love this idea that I talk a lot about outside and mastery. My book is called outside and recovery. And now I call myself the outside and master because I want everyone to master that in themselves. When I say outside in, most people think, oh, you mean like, well, you're going to manip manipulate me as an outsider. And my redirection is, I want you to tune into your outside first, and then you will be easier for you to direct yourself inward. Most of the people think, well, I gotta go inside out. 
and then we have to battle with the things outside of us. You want to be empowered. Remember your own power, which is be empowered again. I can't do that for you. You have to do it yourself. And then when you're out in your outside environment because you're so in your power, it's much easier to stay true to your center and who you are internally. Mm -hmm. So many people need that help right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're post-Panini, right, Amanda? So oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, we've kind of fallen apart in recent years and I think we all need that guidance and we all need to learn how to ask for help when we need it. And I know that you're able to offer that help to people because you know, you've studied, you've worked and you've lived through this stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the trauma that you had to go through. What, what was the purpose behind your book outside in recovery? I know what it is, but the listeners don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When I was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2014, it came as a shock. I had gone through six months of intensive vegan dieting, exercising. I was at my pre-baby weight. I was at the strongest I had ever been. I had abs, folks. The before kids, I didn't have abs. After kids, I didn't have abs. After this particular workout, I had abs and I was so strong. And then I found that lump. And I was thinking, oh, it's probably a reoccurrence of the non-benign cysts I had back in, in college. And it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So then what happened was once I was done with my almost two years of treatment, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and then put on tamoxifen, which is a medication that did try and keep my type of breast cancer from coming back, I was lost. And they discharged me and said, you're cured come back next year. And I went, what? Are you kidding me? I went from seeing you every month flying back and forth to see you because we moved in the middle of that treatment, oh. all this stuff. And now you took the port out, which hurt like a MF. <laughs> and you're like, I'm cured. I don't feel cured. I look like a little old a angry Asian man because my hair grew up salt and pepper really, really short. Oh. No curly hair for me, y'all. It did not happen. <laughs> and that was it. And I, and I, and I had to do this self-discovery of how do I find myself? In the beginning, I did use dance as a form of reconnection. There's an energetic exchange when you're dancing. Even if you're not dancing yourself and you're just in a room where dancers are dancing, it's mm. very therapeutic. As I got better and stronger, I would use the dancing to run away from myself. And it wasn't until one of my kids went into distress and told me while we were on a trip back home to visit their homeschooling friends that they didn't want to be around anymore now. So this is a trigger warning oh. for everybody. And I have full permission to speak on this because yeah. it's part of the story. And so this child showed me their really bad scars that were hidden in their clothing and and share with me they did not want to be alive anymore and they were making plans to exit wow and i was very shocked very shocked i was an occupational therapist before amanda and I have worked with children who were in lockdown units so i knew i knew clinically what to do yeah set up therapy lock up all the knives including uh, the blades and pencil sharpeners mm. i knew all that and then I went right back to running away in my dance. A visiting artist came back, came into Salt Lake City two weeks after. I went to this class and didn't, we didn't realize that this child found unused brand new fish fillet knives that I had missed. Oh, and knew I was doing this event and knew that we used to get vegan pizza here that's gluten-free and knew that when their twin and father ate it they would want a nap encouraged and asked for pizza while i was at this horse shop waited for everyone to fall asleep locked themselves up and carved up their arm wow yeah and i remember like i was bawling i'm like sobbing trying to patch up my child's arms with butterfly because i couldn't take them to the hospital if i had they would have been admitted against everyone's will and i knew has an ot because i worked in lockdown pediatric units, what they were set up as yeah. with my child's personality, I would lose this child. This child would not, oh. I wouldn't, they would feel abandoned. I knew this already. And I was, it was a come 
come to Jesus moment for me. It was a God saying to me, you will lose this baby that you want so hard. This was an IVF baby. You will lose wow. this baby that you were gifted with that picked you as their mother. I believe that too. <laughs> like you're not present and you need to get present like now, now, or you just say goodbye to them. They're not going to make it through the year. And I was like, ah, that was another portion that I talked about in the book because I never was given permission to be worthy of help for me. Anytime I came to my children, things just shifted. I was, I could, I grew up back backbone with my mother-in-law. I could set boundaries with anybody when it comes to my kids. Right. Yeah. And that was the beginning of my recovery, being very present Wow. and knowing that if I wasn't present, then I wouldn't know where my child was at because we had to get that child present. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't until years later, we initially thought it was the stress of the move, their, their fraternal twin transitioning, the dad having emergency bowel surgery before my cancer treatment, the move cross country. We thought it was all that. And it actually, all that stuff actually impacted their, another uh, trigger warning, their SA by a parental family member, like not my, my husband or me, but uh, like a, a grandparent from when they were three, three, four years old. Oh my god! And gosh. eventually traced back to that, right? And it was, we didn't know that at first. She wasn't even aware of it. It was, we just found this amazing complex PTSD therapist who didn't say anything. She already suspected it from day one. She just very patiently helped my child get over the most acute things and eventually has her nervous system calmed down, Amanda. Wow. And she would have like weird dreams about those people, like nightmares. Yeah. And it became more apparent when she just asked, asked a question one day and the therapist was like, oh, is that what you, you know, she didn't lead her, you know what I'm saying? She let her, my daughter bring that up in therapy. Wow. Yeah. That Pretty is a really good therapist. Yeah. And we, we were seeing this, who, who was my therapist and then she's willing to see my, my, my child. Um, it took about two years of therapy before we got to that point. And we're just talking about the first few months and we were fostering kittens already before the move. And when we moved here, I signed up for fostering that first week we got back before her relapse. And then we got the call. We have three kittens for you. And that was the beginning of part of her recovery was to nonstop foster kittens because they were so therapeutic. The babies would just sit on her and she just slept. Mm -hmm. Folks, you have to understand if you meet my kids, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know who was in distress like that because they're both thriving college students now. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. What, what so should what people do if they walk in and they find that their kid is going through something like this and their kid is completely distraught and they have no idea why. Okay. So mm, no, that's hard. <laughs> I, I want to be clear. Um, if your child, no matter what age they are, allows you to witness that most of us are, why did that happen to me as a parent? Can I just stop you cold right now and just tell you how lucky you are. They, they trust you to show that to you. Yeah. A lot of parents think of it as, um, you know, an insult or a fly in the face of their parenting. And I'm going to tell you right now that that's them desperately asking for help. And if you're gifted that opportunity, please stop. Thank the universe that you get to be a part of the healing instead of them leaving you to be a part of their healing. That's yeah. really important. Like you got to believe the kids when they're telling you they're in distress whatever it is that they're asking you for help. Does that make sense? You know this, oh, you yeah. know this, you're, oh my gosh, right? So that was the biggest thing. And for, for her, because I'm, I'm, parent, I'm a first time parent with them for everything. Cause even though they were twins and I have twins at the same time, I was still a first time parent. So my mistake the first time when they showed me was to go clinical, mm -hmm. right? And we oftentimes have to go clinical as parents because we're feeling so guilty. What did I, well, how did I miss this? What I do wrong? I'm responsible, not realizing it's actually their journey that we're lucky enough to be a part of the support should you choose to be. Be aware 
that because they're in distress, whoever you bring in, you need to be the filter. All right, caveat. My parents who are in denial that they're part of the problem, <laughs> right? So like if you're part of the essay, right? Yeah. Just so you know, that kid is going to get away from you. Yeah. Giving them energy through you right now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a parent who did not know, right? Believe them. Because when my my child this came up with this revelation during therapy and said, you know, because it was my husband's family. And they, they were like, well, what am I going to do if dad doesn't believe me? Oh. I said, then I guess dad, and I said, I guess dad's not going to have anything to do with us anymore. Wow. That was a bold stance. I love that though. Amanda, You're like, no, I please. totally believe like, you. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I knew in my oh. heart, he would be like, bye-bye to them. <laughs> and, he, and he was that immediately when she said, because we had her say something to him. And he was like, you know, I'm going to choose you and believe you. Yeah. There's no question. Right. And, and so, um, we can never know what happened. And so this is where I want to bring up the perception of trauma because two children can have the same experience and have completely different perceptions of what that is traumatically in their own nervous systems. Right. And that's the only thing I really want to emphatically say to other parents. If a child comes to you and says, that was really traumatic for me. The first response needs to be, I believe you. How do we get that? How do we get you beyond that? If you negate that, you become a non-trustworthy person and the child will remember and learn that in their subconscious that you can't be trusted and they're just going to give you the perfect face from that off, then on. Yeah. And, or they will, you'll be in the category of the, oh, I'm not worthy you become a part of that belief system. I'm not worthy. No one believes me. My voice is not worthy. You know, I don't tell the truth. Yep. I went through that. I was that kid. And then I started running away and I started creating more problems for myself because I didn't feel safe at home. Yeah. There you go. Right. And for me, even when the other twin said, I think I'm trans. Right. And I'm, and we just moved here in Utah. And again, I have permission to speak on this because, you know, there is now a safety thing. We have to worry about anti-trans bathroom laws here in Utah that were just passed. So mm -hmm. um, what's been really interesting is my only worry was, okay, don't take this personally. I just need to know, has your mom, is this related to my breast cancer? Cause mm -hmm. the second part of the I'm trans is I want top surgery. And I'm like, is that related to the breast cancer? Right. And the, and right. And the answer immediately was, of course, I'm afraid of getting breast cancer. And we had talked about how men can get breast cancer too. Yeah. Right. So this child, 17 years old, also at that time said, no, like I kind of known for a year and I was so afraid to tell you. And I was, wow. my answer was, do you not remember who your mom is? Why the hell would I care? Like, as long as you're safe. Right. And we had just moved to Utah. So we said, I said to them, what do you want to be called? What are your pronouns right now? And we will use that immediately now in this new location because no one knows you anything other. Yeah. And I said, please, can you just give mommy a year to, to slowly transition the people from the past? Right. Here in this new location immediately. And then in relation to, you know, like grandparents, like my parents, I will shift them. They can take a and little while to get used to it. <laughs> Listen, when, when when we fully shifted my son and it, yeah. my parents always knew because I never had a conversation. It was always immediately. Wow. Name. I now have a son and a daughter and, and you know, um, my other twin is also non-binary now. So it's just been, you know, we keep it simple. Non-binary is a little bit too complicated. So it's okay. She uses she, they pronouns with them. Yeah. Um, but for my son, you know, they were, my kids were worried. And I was like, look, 
your grandparents can either celebrate they now have a grandson and a granddaughter or they'll have no grandparents like my parent, my side it was never negotiable regarding that so we never actually had a conversation we just wow. shifted and they just went with it and i was like you can say you know literally my stance was always you accept us for who we are or i guess we'll see you later don't let the door hit your ass on the way out we're done <laughs> Right? Because I never had that. You're talking to a person who, when I was born back in 1968 in Taiwan, my birth was not recognized for a month because I had the audacity to be a girl when I was born. Oh, my. How dare you come out a girl? How dare you be this wonderful woman? (laughs) Well, two years later, my brother was born. Fanfare. And, you know, a child can see the difference, right? Yeah. Right. So it, it's always been this this thing where my parents, they did the best they could. They were very, very impoverished peasants, peasant families, farmers from middle of Taiwan. Taipei is in the northern part of Taiwan, which is like a bean. Right. So the tip of Taiwan is Taipei. My mother came from the middle part of Taiwan, which was you can trace it back to um, across the Taiwan Straits to China, a little a little section of China. And then my father was from southern Taiwan, like stereotype of of wife beatings wife beaters like the taiwanese men are known for being wife beaters so my father never touched my mother because she had five brothers that would have killed him (laughs) however my father's father was a wife beater and i was shipped off to their farm for nine months when my father immigrated to the states and i had to take care of my two-year-old brother i was four i went from taiwan taipei where there was electricity to southern taiwan for eight months no plumbing, no electricity, dirt floors. Hmm. Watching my grandfather beat my grandmother regularly. I had to use a chamber part at night because the Shrek outhouse was too dark. I would have fallen into the toilet. It was a horrifying thing, right? So you you bet your bottom, my kids are never going to experience something like that where they're not supported and not believed. I was like, heck no. I know we've only got a couple of seconds left before we're cut off, but... I love you. I love everything you're doing. I'm going to make sure I list all the be, the ways that people can contact you and grab your book and all that good stuff. But really quickly, what is one thing you love about yourself not related to your physical appearance? My laugh. I love my laugh. I think we should always laugh every day. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself.